we've known each other, you know, uh, for a long time, um, and you have the wildest career. You've gone from one of the great biotech companies in the world, you know, acquired by a big pharma company, worked at Google, and now head of R&D at GSK. It's a pretty wild transition between all of them. So ending up at big pharma, is that where you thought you would be? Yeah. Why? Well, I, I think that um, I've always thought about once I left academia at UCSF as a cardiologist, I wanted to see how I could impact as many patients as possible. And while there's a lot of exciting things that happen in biotech, some of the most innovative things, I think the, the, the scope and the, the scale that you can do things in big pharma, when it's going well, when everybody's rowing in the same direction, the impact you can have is pretty profound. So I had always hoped to have a role like this to head up R&D end to end to be able to impact patients' lives in a meaningful way this way. Cool, and I mean, you're, you're unique in that they let you stay in San Francisco, and yet this is a, basically a UK-based company, um, UK, Philadelphia, and you're in San Francisco. The uh, pipeline you're kind of building almost from scratch, and you're building a new mentality in how to approach drug development. So tell us a little bit about the idea of, you know, your ideas of functional genomics and others to take that hit rate from a relatively low number that Big Pharma complains about all the time. We have to charge big prices because we're not efficient at developing drugs. And you're trying to flip that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, when I came to GSK about 14 months ago, it, was a, it has a terrific pipeline, actually. There's a lot of leaders in HIV, leaders in respiratory for years. Um, a very innovative uh, um, immunology portfolio, actually about 30 or so drugs in the clinic in the immunology. But what's plaguing GSK and I think all of pharma, as you said, is that um, unfortunately, when a drug enters clinical testing, 90% of the time it fails to reach the, the end game to help a patient. This failure rate of 90% is just um, uh, an albatross for the entire industry. And so we spent a lot of time asking what's the biggest impact we can have in terms of improving that. And what we uh, arrived at is based on some work actually at JSK from some of the scientists that shows that if you can find a target that's genetically validated, and by that I mean that, that you have evidence from human genetic studies that show that when you have this genetic abnormality, you get a disease, and we can isolate the protein that's causing that and then transform it back to its normal type or block it if it's causing the disease, that you're twice as likely to have a drug. And that going from 10 to 20 actually is transformational for the industry. You can think about developing twice as many drugs for the same price or being able to develop you know, a drug for half as much, however you want to look at the math. But, but we think that that's an exciting opportunity. And with the explosion of the genetic data that's available for people, for patients throughout the, the globe, uh, and the cost coming down dramatically, um, uh, and we've actually done three or four different um, collaborations with UK Biobank, with Open Targets, with uh, FinGen, and most recently 23andMe, um, we think we can tap into this enormous amount of data that exists to find novel, important targets that hopefully will turn into medicines. That's kind of novel, right? I mean, the head of R&D at one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies buying data from a consumer genomics company. Yeah, it's very novel. I think uh, when you think about the mission of 23andMe was really to someday have a big impact on patients. And, and, and I think we both realized that the impact we're trying to have is better targets. They're trying to have a big impact on their, the people that signed up for their service, those who, who are interested. And we really felt like it's one of the great examples of an absolute win-win on both sides. And it's a wonderful company. It's a great culture. You mentioned San Francisco. It's you know, Richard Scheller, who was running the 23andMe Discovery, and I were, were heads of R&D, re respectively, at uh, Genentech. So we've known each other for a while, and I've known Anne for a while. So it was, it was uh, perfect cultures, perfect opportunity, and I think we're going to develop a lot of great drugs from that. And so the naysayers will say, listen, this is you know, self-annotated data. Yep. I think I have this disease and that disease. How do you get over that self-annotation and get to something that you believe in? Well, there's three or four ways. First of all, um, and, and we've learned this lesson from Google, size matters a lot. And when you have the kind of sample size that they have, they're in the millions. I won't say exactly how many, but, but it's many millions of patients, people who are en enrolled in the service. And um, there's been some studies that they've done internally when they ask a, a person in the, in the 23andMe database, do you have psoriasis as an example or, or something like that? You can go back and look to see if those patients have the known genetic associations that have already been published in the literature. And if you find the seven or eight different GWAS um, findings that were already reported, you have a good sense that the other 10 that are new are probably real, or at least most of them are. And so this, this sort of validation through the published literature is one way. But we also have collaborations with the UK Biobank where, while it's much smaller, it's very deeply phenotyped. And we can use that with open targets and FinGen and other genetic data sets 
to orthogonally validate something. So we think this is a very powerful thing. I should also say many of the targets are, are, are brand new, and we're really introducing a new technology, functional genomics, which you're very familiar with, where we can actually interrogate at the cellular level what is happening and see if we can get biologic validation of these associations to understand what is that base pair change? You got three billion base pairs, one changes and you get a disease. What, what's going on at the cell level? And if biologically that makes sense and we can recapitulate that maybe in preclinical models or, or validate through other drugs that have been developed, et cetera, um, it gives us even more confidence. So I think it's a triangulation on lots of data points. So, I mean, you told me backstage something which astounded me, is that when you look at a disease like ovarian cancer that has a particular mutation that says you'll respond to a drug, you know, BRCA and PARP inhibitors, that there's an entire cohort of patients with functional genomics where you could show that they have the same phenotype yet they don't have that uh, genotype. So tell us a little bit about that data because it's an amazing data. Well, w one of the things that we're really focused on is this functional genomics. What's going on at the, not just the structural level, that's your base pairs. What are your three billion base pairs? 23andMe can tell you, you can do all the sequencing. But what is the function? What is functionally happening? So not just, this, is there a mutation, but is the gene working? The gene is the network. How is it all functioning? And so one of the interesting observations and one of the, the drivers for us looking at a company called Tesaro and ultimately uh, acquiring them was that the synthetic lethality concept where, where you can have a PARP inhibitor that doesn't do much and a BRCA mutation that doesn't do, but the two together have profound impact. And we asked a question, the Tesaro folks in the, the, the global community asked, are there PARP-like other defects? And through this functional genomics assessment, you can see many other proteins like ATR and ATM and RAD50 and the Fanconi proteins, et cetera, that all seem to have this homologous recombination defect, the similar kind of BRCA-like. And in clinical trials, it looks like the PARP inhibitor uh, that we have, Neuroparib, is working not just in the 15% of ovarian cancer patients that have the, 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 the BRCA mutation, but in the patients who have this functional BRCA-like. And so we have a big trial coming out at the end of the year that we're optimistic will help identify maybe as many as three times as many patients who could benefit from this therapy. So it's not just developing a drug, but it's actually figuring out how to use it yeah. in a global sense that's critical. Yeah. Well, I've always said great drugs are discovered, but transformational drugs are developed. And you have to find the other patients that might not be obvious, and how do you personalize them? It's not quite the end of ones, but it's, it's really amassing a data set that we can help the most number of patients do clinical trials. So I have to ask you this, I mean, because I think everybody wants to know, is that you spend time at Google looking at things like longevity. What did you learn? What was your take home from that experience? I mean, it's a wild concept that a search company got into this space at all. Um, let's see. Well, one of the things that confirmed was that um, the person I got to work with, Art Levinson, is, was one of the most terrific people to work with and a brilliant person and is going to continue to change the world. So that was one thing I learned at Calico. Um, it's, well, I guess the big picture at Calico that, that I took away with is that um, as we age, I think of this model as a homeostatic reserve. We, we're all basically buffering from disease. As we're young, we have lots of buffer. We get insults, and, it's, and each insult doesn't seem to cause disease. because so we're we resilient. Buffer. We're resilient. But as you get older, I kind of have the model that you become, for certain diseases, more or less resilient. But over time, your buffer capacity, and so that when we finally see an evidence of clinical disease, it's probably not just the disease happened last week and you became symptomatic, but that was probably accumulating and it be, you've tipped over your buffer capacity. And that's why sometimes early intervention is really gonna be the way to make a biggest impact on a lot of sort of age-related diseases in my opinion. So childhood cancer is predominantly curable, yet once you turn 25, the same cancers become incurable. Does that go along with that concept or? Maybe, you know, I think one of the things that I'm most fascinated about where another place GSK is gonna focus a lot of its energy is in immunology. And the immune system changes quite dramatically as you age. And, and I think that uh, how all this is gonna play out is, is unclear, but clearly the immune system becomes less robust as you get older. And that might be part of this homeostatic reserve that when you're young you have. You know, we're, we're also very focused on cell therapy, turning cells into medicines. And, and maybe we can rejuvenate these cells in a way that can make them more youthful and be able to cure some of these cancers that were early childhood more, more likely to be cured. Well, I think in our short conversation, the audience certainly has a sense, and I think of hope, is that you're bringing a new approach and a new way of thinking to drug development, and it gives all of us some optimism that going forward, we're going to have some shots on goal that we've never had before. So thank you for what we're doing, and it was a true privilege. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Nice to meet you. Thank you.